back, Jack. Will there be a twist or turn in the title race as we prepare for the crazy month of December? Join us as we tackle this week's big games and surprise upsets of Match Week 12, 13 in the Premier League, as well as giving you some pint-sized predictions along the way. So grab your drink of choice, join the fun, and let's dive into the beautiful game with a side of humor and a cold one in hand. This is an all-new episode of Bruise and Banter FC, and it starts right now. Match week 13, man. Match week 13. You almost slipped up there. Almost said 12. Almost did. I'm glad I caught that because I would have been a week late. We've already done that one. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. But I see your can you got there, man. What are you drinking? I have Sierra Nevada's Celebration Fresh Hop IPA. It's a Christmas, Christmas IPA. Hopefully that doesn't continue where I can't speak very well. Probably because I haven't <laughs> well, had... It depends how many either. of those you've had. <laughs> depends how many of those Zero. you had. I think that's my problem. <laughs> oh, there we go. We'll get that first sip in, man. Then you'll be <laughs> talking nice. Yeah. How is it? 6.8%. It's pretty good, actually. Spicy. Yeah. Very malty at the front. So kind of heavier for an IPA. Doesn't really have a hoppy finish, which is weird. It's That's like malt- good for you, isn't it? Very. So, uh, seven, uh, seven point eight. Seven point eight. That's that's a good score. I'm <laughs> drinking Adams Pilsner from Single Hill Brewing. Where are they? You at? Can't see the can. They are out of Yakima, Ooh. Washington. Yakima. Well, let's try it. I have not had this beer before. That is a very good, refreshing, light beer. Nice. Right up your alley. I think it is right up my alley. Yeah, I think I'd give it an 8 out of 10. It's a, I would drink again, would buy again. So, yeah, that is, that's a good one. Nice. That's a good score, my man. I would call what it like that? a Bud Light, but with actual flavor in a real beer. You know, not just and water. Actual alcohol in it, too. <laughs> yeah. Not as much as yours. This one's at 4.8%. So That's okay. You got twice as much. So that should count. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Yes, it should. So speaking of good scores, let's get into match week 13. All right, man. We'll start off with the pretty much the game of the weekend, or the one that was hyped up to be <laughs> the game of the weekend. Hyped. Hyped. We had Manchester, Manchester City and Liverpool going at it at the Etihad. This one ended 1-1. Ends in a draw after a first half strike by Erling Hollins canceled out by a second half strike from Trent Alexander-Arnold. Yeah, man. Trent rocking the all-new Preds. Predators going back to David Beckham style with the lip folded all the way down. I love those, man. I Ooh, love them. I hated with the Beckham ones that were like chrome, but they're so crisp looking. Like, they're just such the nostalgic feels in those shoes for me it's it's more of the zidane was rocking those preds yeah Yeah. that's for sure but the style of beckham was the you know tongue all the way down towards the bottom yeah and that's how trent wore them they look fantastic something right for him yeah and you know he actually didn't do too bad in this game defensively i would say you know jeremy doku started on that left hand side for city running at trent and I I thought he kept him fairly quiet. He had help from uh, Zabozalai and Joel Matip. He was kind of showing him inside, so he was running into traffic, but didn't really get burned by Doku. So I gotta I gotta give kudos to Trent there. Yeah, but not you know many who he did get burned by. <laughs> you know who he did get burned by is Nathan Ake. Yeah, yeah, he sure did. He sure did. Who, who played a fantastic ball to Erling Holland, who gets his strike off, puts it past Allison. 1-0 in the first half. 27th minute, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I mean, Holland doing what he does. Scoring. Yeah. 
Yeah, and nice finish by him, but that run from Ake. Whew. For a center back, that was a thing of beauty. Center back, left back, whatever you want to call him. Jack of all trades. I was just going to say, can we can we call him a center back anymore? He doesn't even play center back 90% of the time. I will say a little bit of poor marking there from Matt Tip, Van Dyke. Holland got in between both of them. Could Wait, Allison have done a little bit better on the save? He definitely yeah. could have done better on his clearance where he kicked the ball yes. out and he slips and then City come down and score. <laughs> could have done better there. Could have done better. And that, that that whole first half, man, I would say was pretty much dominated by Manchester City. Bernardo Silva, man, got to give a shout out to him in that first half. He was just finding every pocket of space in that midfield. He is a visionary, man. How, like, the movements he makes to find these spaces is just unreal because no. it's like on, he's on one side of the field and then you're like watching the ball get played like three passes. And then all of a sudden he's all the way on the other side. No one within 30 yards. Of him. You, like what's his position? Just on the field. He plays Free? everywhere. Free? Free? <laughs> Always open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Second half would start, and I would say Liverpool grew into it. They did. City, yeah. you could say, maybe could see tired a bit. Yeah. One, would, one could argue. One could argue. Pep didn't make any substitutions in this game. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. I would, His... I would say that has a lot to do with it because, I mean, Klopp made all five substitutions. He did. I will say Pep didn't have the strongest bench. If you look at the benches, I would I would have given it to Liverpool. No Jack Grealish. He was out ill. Obviously, no Kevin De Bruyne. John Stone's still coming back from an injury. I guess, yeah. yeah. Rico Lewis. <laughs> Calvin Rico Phillips. Lewis, Calvin Phillips. Bunch of kids. Oscar Bob. Yeah. Not going to do it for you against this Liverpool side. No, but that Trent, man, beautiful first touch, beautiful finish. Hard low shot to that bottom left corner. Allison had no chance. Ederson. Ederson, sorry. Wrong Brazilian wrong, goalkeeper. Wrong Brazilian goalkeeper. <laughs> Speaking of Allison, let's talk about Allison, man. Since I already mentioned his name. This was not his best performance. No, no. Actually, by his standards, it was quite poor. I mean, he slips for his clearance for that first goal. He almost got caught on the ball. And he just yeah. looked honestly shaky. Every time the ball was going to his feet, he just looked nervous, shaky, not full of confidence, whatever you want to say, man. If I'm a Liverpool Aaron fan, Rain, I, yeah. was, oh, I was, oh, <laughs> I was worried. I was worried. And there's even that opportunity that where the ball kind of went up in the air and the ball went in and they called a foul. I think it was a kanji on Allison because he kind of had his hand on his shoulder or do you think that was a foul? No. I thought it was no. soft. I, I thought it was soft. I know the goalkeepers are a protected, protected group. But I think yeah, Liverpool got they, away with one there, man. I think they, they got did. a little luck there. They did. And, you know, for all of the times I have said, you know, Manchester City don't have any calls go against them, this was one. So I will not say that anymore. About time. But yeah, I mean, it, I don't understand it, man. Goalkeepers, they act like they're made of glass to protect them from shattering. I don't understand it. I didn't think that was a foul. Yeah, you can put your arm on someone's shoulder, but it didn't look like you had any force behind it. Maybe, Maybe because Allison was jumping in the air. I don't know. That's, that's the only excuse I can give, but I thought it was soft. Yeah, me too. First, like, like, I think if, you know, if it went to VR, I don't think it would have got overturned for a goal. And vice versa. Because it was called a foul, I don't think it would get overturned yeah, either. they're going to stick with the on-field call. Seems to be what they've done these days. It is. But, but yeah, I it mean, is. Jurgen Klopp came out after the match. Did his whole spiel complain the players didn't have enough time to rest for such a big game. Yada, yada. But he also revealed that Allison tore his hamstring. So. Yeah, he did go down injured there for a second. Pulling that, you know, grabbing his hamstring. So, yeah. That tracks. It does. That result, man, it takes Manchester City out of first place, and we'll get to the 
first place team here in a bit, but big result for Liverpool. I mean, that's kind of showing where they're at. They're title contenders. They're Liverpool is just now one point behind Manchester City in third. And that's yeah, a and decent it, result at the Etihad compared to last huge. season where they got thrashed. <laughs> it's a huge result. I mean, City won 23 games in a row at home. It's their first draw in 24. For Liverpool to go to the Etihad, which has been, you know, a bugaboo place for literally every team in the Premier League, and get a point out of that. I, well done, Liverpool. I can only applaud them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, we, I, I think this is a three-horse race, but, you know, the points on the board would say otherwise. How would they say otherwise? Well, Aston Villa's tied on points with Liverpool. So wouldn't it be a four, five horse race? I think right now it it is, but I bet by by come here a little bit, a couple months maybe. End of December. End of December. All of these teams play almost twelve games in the month of December. It's going to be intense. Well, we got this pick wrong. I picked City to win this. You picked Liverpool, and it ended in a draw. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but I mean. It was both teams were good for a draw, I would say. Tale of two halves. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Well, let's move from the top of the table down towards the bottom of the table, man. We had <laughs> Sheffield United hosting Bournemouth, and they lost 3 <laughs> 1. Two Marcus Tevenier goals and a Justin Clivert goal for Bournemouth saw them take all three points. And it was a late consolation goal from Holly McBurney for Sheffield, which that was also. Their first shot on target, that Ollie McBurney goal, I think it was the 88th minute, something yeah, like that. It was very, very late in the match. But let, let's but talk I mean, about this first goal, man. What a mistake from Fodderingham to just hand the ball, essentially, to Justin Kleibert. Probably the easiest so goal yeah, ever. I think life. that was the second goal, yeah, where he goes, I don't know what he's doing, why he doesn't just clear it, but he tries to take a touch and like misses the ball or something ball gets caught under his feet looks rushed not comfortable with it terrible terrible over. mistake and Cliver, i mean credit to him it was a tight angle and he yeah. finished it nicely and honestly bournemouth man they played sheffield united off the park in this one they really did i think this is how uh areola's team anthony areola the bournemouth manager wants to play you can see he likes those wingers he likes them out wide they got a load of wingers, so I mean... Yeah, they do. And they're fast, and too. They are. And so this this was, I think, the perfect game for Bournemouth. They're coming off a good couple results. They beat Newcastle last time out. They got this win against Sheffield. Obviously, with the 10 points being deducted from Everton, Bournemouth are sitting kind of pretty right now in 16th. Yeah, man. I mean, they're seven points clear of the drop zone. They've won three and five. They're playing good football right now. Yeah, these past couple of weeks are are looking good. And I know Iriola, he had said that Bournemouth had a tough run of fixtures. So he said, give me till, I think it was, de- like you said, some December date where yeah. they can finally play some teams that they might have a chance at. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think they play, yeah, they play Villa at home next. So that'll be a tough one for them, but they'll get a string of games here where they play some of the bottom half of the table. Yeah. So they get like crystal palace, Luton forest, Fulham all before the end of December. Yeah. Yeah. I so think games that they keep playing like could this, be I think they'll, they'll be fine. Yeah. And honestly, the opposite could be said for Sheffield, man. Uh, they said 18th. They defend poorly. They make mistakes that cost goals. And honestly, they're going right back to the championship. Yeah. I mean, they are terrible going forward. Some games will be gifted with some goals. But other than that, man, they can't create nothing going forward. They're unorganized, especially when they get caught on the counter. And I'm sorry, Fodderingham. I don't think you're a Premier League goalkeeper either. So. Well, not only that, but I mean, who's the manager? Higginbottom, I think, is the manager yeah. of mm-hmm. Sheffield. I don't know how long he lasts, man. If they keep playing like this, I mean, 50-50 shot, him or company gets fired first. So, I think kind of what's saving 
his job right now is you look at the results they have or have had. It's right before an international break, they get a good result. So, for example, before the international break, they got a draw against Brighton. And they won their game before that. I and they won their game that. before that against Wolves. There you go. Uh, before that, they had that good result at Everton for that previous yeah. international break. Yeah, and I mean, how big is that looking now? <laughs> and so it kind of buys them some leeway, but typically it's right before an international break, a club will fire a manager so they can bring someone new in. And so yeah. he's you're getting that kind of vicious cycle where he should be fired, but then he gets a couple of results. Should be fired, but then he gets a couple of results, and it's going to hurt him, and they're going down, man. I think I will. I will say it right now. Sheffield United, eighteenth or nineteenth Premier League. <laughs> they finish eighteenth or nineteenth. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be one of those. Sorry, nineteenth or twentieth. <laughs> between them and Burnley, who's going to be is. worse? I think Sheffield are worse, but we'll see. I agree. All right, well, let's move on, man. Nottingham Forest they hosted Brighton. And this was a fun game, had all kinds of controversy, oh. all kinds of goals. This one ended 3-2 to Brighton. And Brighton finally get a win, man, after three draws in a row. How badly did they need that? They really needed that result, too. They hadn't won in, what, a couple months, it seemed like. I think it was September was the last time yeah. they won. Yeah. Yeah. So they desperately needed that before getting into a run of fixtures. But what they didn't need in this match was a red card. And a stupid no, red card. they but did we'll get a get red card. Lewis Dunk in the 73rd man. Two yellow we'll cards for descent in the same, like, 30 Within seconds. Yeah. It was, yeah. For the leader of your team, I mean, come on, man. You got to be smarter than that. Just walk away. It wasn't even that bad of a call. Just walk away. Well, let's let's go over the goals in that game. It started off fast. Anthony Alanga gets a goal early in this one, three minutes in. Morgan Gibbs White would get a pen. And uh, Brighton, they would get goals from Evan Ferguson. And then two goals from João Pedro, his second goal coming from the spot. But yeah, I guess let's let's talk about that PK that was given to Forrest, the second goal. Was it a PK for you? It was kind of, I mean, the referee didn't call it. VAR went back and looked at it. And I was when I was watching this man, it took at least two minutes from when the foul happened to when it was deemed a PK. Two minutes had gone by. Like they had been playing. They stopped the game finally. The ref went over to the monitor and it was just And then on that one, I don't know if that's a clear and obvious error. It's it it probably is just about a foul. I, I would agree it probably was a foul, but a clear and obvious error, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, when you slow it down enough, yeah, sure. It looks like a foul. But with what the ref said on the field, I would have stuck with it. And especially if it's that long in between. No. No, stick with the play on the field. Just keep doing what you're doing. Business there was another good. one <laughs> that I watched. It was a foul. And then by the time the play happened, like the foul actually occurred to the time the PK was taken, it was four minutes. It was, yeah, something ridiculous. But I guess that's what we have to deal with now for the right calls, air quotes, to get made. Yeah. But your boy. If it took took this long and, you know, they got the call right every single time, you'd never hear a complaint from us, but because they get it wrong so often. I wouldn't say this one was wrong, but it just. No. I'm just saying in the grand scheme of yeah. VAR, they get a lot wrong, and they shouldn't. But you're, you're one of your favorite teenage boys, man. That sounds dirty. Gross. <laughs> Sorry I said that. Regret it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> one of your favorite young players. How about that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. As long Ferguson, as you man, with a nice finishing goal for Brighton. Dude, he's going to be a player. Give him a couple more years. I think he definitely needs to stay at a team like Brighton for at least another year, for sure. I I think two, maybe three. 
And he needs to be able to get his feet under him, become more consistent, stay healthy for a long period of games. And then I think Brighton can be like, all right, you can go for 100 mil plus whatever. But Speaking I, of I just... staying healthy, man, Brighton are hurting with injuries right now. Yeah. No Estupinian, no Matoma, who you can tell they're missing down that left side. Sully March is out for the season. Danny Welbeck's out. Well, I mean... Ansu Fati he... came off injured in this game. Yeah, Danny Welbeck's always hurt, so whatever. Lewis <laughs> Dunn got a red card. They're Not hurting, they're hurting right now. But I got that one right. I picked Brighton, you picked Forrest. So kudos to me. Yeah, kudos to you. All right, well, let's move on to the bottom dwellers in the Premier League, man. Burnley hosted West Ham. Burnley were up 1-0 until the 86th minute, and then they absolutely crumbled. Crumbled, yeah, man. Took a poop right in the middle of the pitch. Their first goal came from Jay Rodriguez from the spot. Looks soft. Kudis fouled Kuliosho. They also had a shout-out. In the first half, Kuliosha was fouled from uh, Sofian Kufal. I think, this is, I think that's his first name. Mm -hmm. I thought that one was more of a PK than the second one, maybe. But I don't know. That one is one I'm on the fence. I was on the fence about that first no call for a PK. So I think they just about got it right. What are your thoughts? I mean... In the grand scheme of things, calling one a pen and one not, I think is probably fair. But, I mean, you don't think that while you're watching it live. So No. Or if it's, one of your if it's your team. Yeah, exactly. As we've seen from, you know, Arsenal games. So, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deflect and say, uh, how good was Cole Yosho? Holy cow. <laughs> Coolio Osho, man, is Burnley's only attacking threat. I mean, oh, Vincent Company. So, he's so good on the ball. I he mean, is. He's quick. He's fast. And honestly, Vincent Company, he wants to play this expansive brand of football. And they're getting burned from it, man. Burned. Burned. All the time. West Ham, like, man, their two goals. Kudis. Kudis was just involved in every goal. He committed the foul. He sends a very good cross in that gets turned into an own goal. And then he has another lovely cross in for Thomas Suchek, who has a lovely volley in the 91st minute. And all three points, man, go to the Hammers. Burnley, yeah. they suck. Dude, they're so bad. And, and like, you, know you want to get, you want to have hope for them when they take the lead. But, like, if you have more than 30 minutes of football left and Burnley has the lead, you better believe that they're going to give it up. It's going to happen. They just don't have think, the quality. They don't have the legs, especially coming off the bench. And, man, they are just so bad defensively. They are just they just give up goals left and right. Like, West Ham didn't even get out of first gear. Mohamed Kudis looks like a world-class signing for West Ham. And, yeah, I, to quote, you know, a good friend of mine, Burnley just sucks. <laughs> is that friend me <laughs> yeah, yeah, <thank> you. <laughs> Here, here's my theory burnley did so good in the championship that they're not gonna fire vincent company they're just gonna keep him around for when they're in the championship next year and they can play well there i mean that's a good shout they'll break darby's record of you know less than 11 points if they do that but you know at least they'll set some championship records on their way back. Well, I don't know if they'll break Turby County's record. They're at four points, but I mean, they're they're on pace to not do very well. Let's just say that. And speaking of a team that's doing well and in that relegation fight and was promoted, Luton Town beat Crystal Palace 2-1, baby. All three this goals would come within 10 minutes. Sir, you might have been on to something. I might have been on to something for my Premier League prediction of Luton yeah. surviving. We'll see. It's yeah. early. It I is early. It's not optimistic. <laughs> no. 
But all three goals came in 10 minutes of each other in this one, man. Palace thought they had the lead in the 66th after a fantastic ball over the top from Mr. Michael Elise, who was back for this game. To Ed to Edward, but his deflected shot kind of bounces and then it hits his hand and then he finishes Man, it again. It was so unlucky. Like yes, the motion of his hand makes it look like he had, like intentionally oh, he did it. Intentionally it deflected but, all over, it hit his hand yeah. and just Yeah, it's so unlucky that the ball just came up and hit him in the hand. But you know, as Luton Town, you need a bit of luck to win a match. So and they got that it. is right. That is right. <laughs> Luton would actually take the lead in this one in the 72nd. Ted and Menjai in the 72nd man off a corner kick gets on the end of it. 1-0 to Luton. Palace, though, would equalize through a golazo, man, from Michael Elise. Curler. What was coming back from him, man. Curler, worldy. worldy. Curler. It's so good to see him back fit. Unfortunately, his counterpart, Fabrici Eze, came off injured in this one. He did. That's bad news for Palace. Yeah. But Luton, man, they grabbed the winner through Jacob Brown in the 83rd minute. What a effing ball from Ogbene to Jacob Brown. What Holy a ball. Crap. Holy crap. Beautiful. Yeah. Palace, they hit the frame of the goal in the 103rd minute, and it was a wild inning because right after they hit that frame, Luton countered. It was just wild few minutes there at the it end. Was, but they was a on. great final 10, I guess with extra time, probably 20 minutes. But <laughs> it was a fantastic ending to the match. You know, three goals and a post. Can't ask for much more. And it's back and forth. You love that. But huge three points for Luton, who are now four points clear of the relegation zone. They sit in 17th, four points above Sheffield. Yeah, and first home win for them as well in the Premier first League. home win in the Premier League. Massive. Yep, massive for them. Man, I, I I got nothing bad to say about Luton right now. I mean, they've picked up was that five points in their last five games for a team that we were saying looked awful, like around Burnley and Sheffield United. They've definitely separated themselves from that pack. Not just in point, but the way they're playing. Everyone was tipping Burnley to be the good team to come out of the championship. Well, I knew something, man. Luton Town has the right tactics. I rubbed my football crystal ball, and I'm, I'm, I saw something. Yeah, you did. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to, honestly, another game I was really excited about. This was Newcastle and Chelsea. Yeah, and I mean... This match was probably the match we thought it was for about 45 minutes. For 45. It was an evenly kind of contested <laughs> first half. It ended 1-1 at the half. A beautiful ball from Lewis Smiley to Alexander Isak, man, and scores with that through ball. And he's How old 17. is he? He's 17. 17 years old. Holy cow. Nuts. Yeah. The composure of a 30-year-old. Fantastic. And Chelsea, they would get the equalizer through a Raheem Sterling free kick, which was a beauty. That was a good free kick, man. It was. It was. And I, I just remember listening to the commentators. I forget who it was. And they're like, we're not used to seeing Raheem Sterling step up to hit a free kick. This is weird. They did say that. <laughs> <laughs> it I was mean, one of those like, oh, when does he take free huh. kicks? <laughs> Where did Reese James at? And he hits a banger. There's a reason why he was taking it, apparently. Hint, Reese James was sitting in the shower because he got sent off. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, but I will say about the foul from Trippier. I on think Sterling, it was, yeah. I think it was very unlucky that he got called for a foul on that one. I mean, very That's a foul. Very That's little a foul. contact. Sterling went down way too easy. When you're running at that speed, it don't take much. Especially when your arms are up here. Run like a T-Rex. However he runs. He runs funny, man. It, Cracks me up. Funny. Yes. Reminds me of another player that we played with that would run like that. <laughs> Back in our college days, I, I got it ran funny too. Uh, moving on though. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> in the second half, Newcastle man, they put Chelsea to the sword. They got two quick goals in the 60th and the 61st minute. 
the second goal, man. Scored by Jolington, but what a mistake from Tiago Silva, man. What a so mistake. He, Which one's in- worse? Hold on. Hold on. Which one's worse? Tiago Silva's or Fodderingham's? For Sheffield. Tough. Tiago Silva's. Yeah. He finally showed his age, man. I don't think that would ever happen. <laughs> he kind of did in this one, yeah. I mean, the guy's 38, closer to 39. I think he's 39, isn't he? Is he 39 now? Okay, well, my point exactly. I mean, the guy's seems seemingly ageless. At some point in the Premier League, it's going to show. Yeah, he's 39. There you go. Yeah, that was, that was awful, man. It was, it was terrible, yeah. It was so bad. And as I alluded to earlier, Reese James would get his second yellow in the 73rd for a foul that was the yellow card. He got his first yellow card for just kicking the ball away. Okay, so question back to you. Whose red card was worse after two yellows, Lewis Dunk or Reese James? <laughs> Lewis Dunk. <laughs> Lewis Dunk was in with like 30 seconds for just mouthing off to the ref. Twice. I know. I know. That's he terrible. Just I don't get it. Yeah. Both were man, I saw this funny set that Reese James hasn't played three games in a row for Chelsea. And I forget how many years it was. So it's like two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. He's either hurt. He's always or injured. Yeah. And then this one was a suspension now. But I mean, Chelsea, <laughs> they, they looked real bad after that red card, man. And they were just kind of run over. Anthony Gordon would put Newcastle's fourth in with a lovely finish in the 83rd. Newcastle looked up for this one, man, even with all their injuries. All and injuries. Yeah. I mean, maybe it looks like they got a deeper squad than we thought they did. That's for sure. And well, we have a 17-year-old playing fantastic just through play. balls. <laughs> when you have a 17-year-old coming off the bench to look like that, I mean, it helps a lot. And, and then a Chelsea, Chelsea team that, you know, came back after the international break looking like their old selves rather than their last couple of games. They really did, yeah. They really did. But Newcastle, they have a they have a tough week, man. They go to Paris to play PSG. And then they play Manchester United. Yep. So this, Most this will be a good week for them. The Premier League. It's, it's, Weird, it's right? Yeah. Weird, yeah. I got Versus more interesting Nick, stats when we get to their game. Chelsea, on the other hand, Potch said this was their worst performance of the season. Yeah. I, as he was sitting in the stands watching from a bird's eye view. I, I can agree with that, honestly. I mean, this Newcastle team, I wouldn't necessarily say they, you know, played them off the park. But it, in certain times of this game, it sure looked like it. And Chelsea had their opportunities, but you're right. Like, no creative spark whatsoever in this team. I, I don't know where it's going to come from. There were some in- interesting uh, inclusions in that Chelsea squad. You had Leslie Ugochukwu, who started over 100 mil man Caicedo. I'm guessing because he had to fly back from South America after international break. Yeah. But then also, Batashale started over Levi Colwell or DeSassi. Yeah, who have been starting the majority of the games. Over They him. have been, yeah. Yeah, it was. Ray also played terrible. I mean,. Cole Palmer, was was he on the pitch? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Oh, he question. was in Livermento's pocket. That's where he was. Yeah, okay. that's it. That's, <laughs> it. that's where he was. That's where he was. He's playing hide-and-go-seek. He was. Honestly, Chelsea, they played like their position in the table. Tenth. Tenth. <laughs> yeah. And I, I honestly, with looking at the teams above them, I don't see them going any higher this season. So... Not much. I mean, I don't know. They when you put in a good performance against City, I mean, the Tottenham game was eh. They put in a good performance against Arsenal. They're capable of a good performance, but I'm obviously so not consistent with it. Yeah. And then I know every Chelsea fan's waiting for Nkunku to come back, but I mean, let's be honest. This is a guy who hasn't played in months, has not been Premier League proven. And you guys are putting a lot of pressure on him. There is a lot of pressure right now. On not only Kuku that, to come in and score goals. Not only that, but his injury record looks more like Reese James's than anybody else on this team. That is not, not a good sign. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, you hope for the best, but ugh, that's a lot just to hold on one player. 
Yeah, especially when, like, looking at this team, where does he play? Are you going to play him as a number 10? Are you going to play him as a second I don't second think Nico striker? Jackson will be starting. And Cuckoo does better when he has a striker in front of him. Kind of like that Griezmann role for France. So It'll we'll be an interesting one, that's for sure. One. He should be back here soon, too, in Cuckoo, yeah. so we'll see. Yeah, he's in first team training again, so give it a week or two when he could be playing again. All right, well, let's move on to Brentford, who hosted Arsenal. Arsenal would win this 1-0, move top of the table, thanks to uh, Arsenal's favorite player, Kai Kai Havertz! A winner in the 80s. Kai Havertz scores a game. Waka waka, yay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is he literally the, winner, the worst song I've ever heard. And what it like, it's a diss. I was like, it's an insult. It it's is a straight up insult. insult. If I'm Kai Havertz, I might have laughed at it the first time, but like the more I hear it, the more I'm like, guys, what the hell? Oh, he had to hear it for 10 minutes after he scored that goal, man. I can tell you that. <laughs> but he got Wait, the winner yeah. in the 87th. Beautiful ball from, I believe it was Bakayo Saka. Bakayo Saka. Back yeah. post. 100%. But this was, this was an interesting game, man. So we saw the return of uh, Aaron Ramsdale. as Davin Raya yeah. couldn't play against his home team or parent club, whatever you call it. Thoughts on yeah. that? How do you feel about David Raya now? I guess give me your thoughts there. I I feel the same about him. I do. Uh, because I'll be honest with you, this might be a little bit biased, so I'm going to preface it with that because I love Aaron Ramsdale. Every Arsenal More. fan does. Because yeah. honestly, I was listening to something the other day. It's because Ramsdale was very much in the public's eye, doing lots of interviews, being kind of a, a big face in the club. Being English obviously helps. And so I think a lot of people are... I heard that there's a theory that that's kind of why a lot of Arsenal fans were upset by his dropping. Yeah, for me, it's more of the fact that he didn't really do anything wrong. Like, usually you get dropped because you had a string of poor performances or a club signs somebody that is, like, out and out much better than you. It looks like it. It looks like it in this case. In this match, sure. But, yes, he played poor. Looked like he was trying to do too much. I just think it's more of Arteta's fault for putting a lot of pressure on him with, you know, the poor timing of announcing that David Raya is going to be a permanent transfer at the end of the season, literally on Friday, right before the match. Like, you could have waited till Monday to do that. Like, that makes no sense to me. But just the sheer fact that he's got so much pressure on him, he wants to win his spot back. I think a lot of it had to do with his poor decision-making, especially, you know, on the throw that I didn't know if that was, you know, spiking it like it was the ball. A th- it looked like it was uh, a throw he tried to stop and hold on to, and it got away from him. Yeah. So he threw I, the ball I, straight into the ground, straight to a Brighton player. I don't know that player. Was- Spike, intentional grounding, or a fumble. I couldn't tell, but, you know. Any of us who have played goalkeeper, who is not a goalkeeper, has done that. But mm-hmm. yeah. Yep, 100 times. He also got caught on the ball, made a pretty terrible pass there that Arsenal were lucky not to get punished for. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, the two guys that saved them for those, probably the two best players on the pitch in this match, so. Teclan Rice <laughs> saved the first one, and then there was one in the second half. Uh, Zinchenko. That same. Zinchenko cleared off the line, yep. Yeah, and that one arguably was more impressive because he definitely had to die for that one. Zinchenko did. So, Honestly, if I'm a Brentford man, I'm feeling, I'm feeling hard done. They had two goal line clearances, and honestly, I thought they should have got something from this game. I thought they defended very well. They were very commanding and just suffocating Martinelli Saka honestly didn't yeah. do anything that game they were double teaming them every time pretty Not much saying okay turn and quick play the ball quickly yeah I mean Same. they stifled Arsenal's offense for the majority of this match so it just took a moment of brilliance essentially for them not to get something out of it but I agree Arsenal definitely didn't deserve to win this match 
and Brentford, I would feel hard done too, especially with the two goal line clearances. Two goal line clearances. Arsenal, they did have a goal called back to offsides. That was very close, but looked about just the right decision there at the end of the first half on Trossard. It was interesting. Trossard played in midfield on this one with Rice yeah. and Odegaard. Yeah, um, it was interesting. It looked like Odegaard sat back a little bit and let uh, Martinelli almost go up as a second striker as Trossard would go more out to the left. But yeah, interesting tactics. Um, it Very didn't attacking. Work. It didn't work attacking. because it was until, you know, Trussard got taken off and they put Havertz on where they actually got the goal. But, yeah, I mean, all credit to Brentford. They sat in the whole match, didn't let Arsenal create anything. They themselves didn't really create anything going forward, but they forced mistakes out of Ramsdale. They but, pressed high. They were, they were waiting for Ramsdale, and they pressed, suffocated them. Arsenal had to play through that press. But yeah, when they, I mean, again, they had very good opportunities, two goal line clearances. So that first Tough one result though, for Brentford. That first one though, if Mbomo isn't selfish and squares the ball to Bisa, um, that's a goal, hundred percent. Just saying, wide open. He was. But with that win, Arsenal man, they jumped top of the table, first place on thirty points, one point above second, Man City and Brentford. They are in 11th on 16 points, tied on points with Chelsea, who sit 10th. Yeah, Chelsea only have one goal better goal differential. I mean, the way Brentford's playing this season, I mean, against this top six, especially at home, the only team they've lost to is Arsenal. That's I did see that, yeah, in the past couple um, years. So they, got, they could have a lot of confidence after this match, even though they lost. And Arsenal, I mean, if you're going to be champions, you've got to be able to dig one out. Even if you don't deserve to win, you got to get the three points no matter what. Especially after City and Liverpool time drawing earlier in the day. All right, well, let's move on to another North London club, Tottenham, as they hosted Aston Villa. This one ended 2-1 to Villa. And honestly, what a game of football this was. Entertaining, oh, back and forth. It was, it was this- just a good game. If just one person could learn how to stay on sides, this one would have been like seven goals. And you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that that was what it what it came down to is yeah. I mean Spurs, they went up first off a deflected shot from Giovanni Lo Celso. What a strike it was. It is unlucky for Martinez that it was deflected, because I think he would have stopped it. But yeah. What a strike. That was a difficult angle to hit the ball for Lo Celso. Spurs, they honestly, they for me, they dominated that first half. They were definitely the better team. Probably a little unlucky, unlucky not to be 2-0 up for halftime. Villa, they got a free kick. Free kick goes into the box. Spurs playing that high line. Comes back to Hanum. Pau Torres, man, puts in a thunderous header right before halftime. Not just that, dude. What a ball by Douglas Luiz. I don't think this ball got above the crossbar. And he hit it from 60 yards out, right on his head. Holy cow. Yeah. That's good, though. Pau Torres, he had missed a sitter earlier in that first half, so glad he made up for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, this game had everything, man. Hitting Both teams hit the post. Kuliseski, man, missed a sitter in the first half. Both goalkeepers making fantastic saves. I will say Emmy Martinez was definitely the busier. Had a fantastic yes. double save that had a beautiful save, man, from Hoiberg from, I don't know, 20 yards out. What a save. Beautiful. What a save. I mean, there were 33 shots in this match. I think it was 18 for Tottenham and 15 for Aston Villa. And Tottenham had, I think, seven or eight shots on target to Villa's five. And it's just like, yeah, they're both teams, there's like, no midfield, just defense to attack the whole time. Or it was. And Not as I mentioned, time. Spurs would dominate that first half. Emery, man, he made some changes going into the second, brought off Matty Cash, who was on a yellow. A little lucky maybe not to have been a red mm-hmm. for another rash challenge. And he brought off Musa Diaby and put on Yuri Tielmans. And that definitely well, changed things up. That was a fantastic tactical move because Villa got the winner, man, through Ollie Watkins. Assisted by none other than halftime substitute, Yuri, Yuri Tillman. Tillman's. 
<laughs> what a finish yeah. though from Watkins, man. I mean, he oh, is yeah. in form right now. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I would consider him one of the best English strikers right now, especially with Ivan Tony out. But I mean, when it comes to technique, man, Ollie Watkins has got it. He he's playing good. Yeah, no doubt about that. And this win, huge for Villa as they jump Spurs now. They moved into fourth place, as you had mentioned, on 28 points. Spurs, this draws them down to 26. This is their third loss in a row. Yeah. Yeah, man. And they play Man City next. Did Tottenham peak too soon? Are they Are they looking like they lost their legs? Is this the uh, spiral that all their fans were looking for? I think I think so. So here's I what I'd so. say to that. I still think Spurs will finish above Villa come into the season. Uh, the reason I say that is because when you see the starting lineups for both of these teams, I think Spurs is better. When you include James Madison, Mickey Van de Ven, Romero. I mean, Spurs in this game were playing with four fullbacks in their defense. I mean, I think that's obviously assigned to Eric Dyer. You're not going to get any playing time. You should probably leave. But I think a healthy Spurs team is better than that Villa team. Um, I think when they get those players back, they will, again, you'll start seeing those results. But again, they are a thin squad right now. Their first 11 is good. But then after that, it, it slims down real quick for Tottenham. I mean, you saw Benton Kerr. He had to come off injured in this game again, which is a huge blow. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I again, I think a, a full strength Spurs squad versus a full length Villa squad. I do think Spurs are the better team. On paper, yes, I think Unai Emery's got this team purring when they face each other next. It will be at Villa Park, where it is a fortress for them. But I just I got to give credit to Unai Emery, man. He's doing a wonderful job at Aston Villa. And, you know, someone here might have been looking at their football crystal ball, predicting that one Aston Villa will finish in the top four. Just say. Here's, here's what I'll say to that, is I don't think anyone expected Spurs to have the start they did. No. I think no. everyone I mean, thought I, this was a project. I, I predicted them to finish 10th this season. So, yeah, I will give credit where credit is due. The first 10 games of their season was absolutely fantastic. Since then. Not so much. But question for you, because I heard this recently. It was quite a debate. If Unai Emery coached Arsenal last season, would they have won the title? Probably not, because I think the real issue was William Saliba being out. I just, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Like, that is a great debate, especially with how good Villa is doing versus yeah. how Arsenal played the last end of last season. <laughs> so ironically, I was thinking about that to do with Unai Emery, about how he went to Arsenal. Obviously, we saw how it went there. Not the best. But I think he learned a lot about the Premier League yeah, at his I stint agree. with Arsenal. And so when he came back to the Premier League, he knew not to make you know, those same mistakes that he did. And mm. we've seen what he's been doing with Villa. Obviously, they've been playing fantastic. They're doing incredible. Don't want to discredit Villa at all. And so, yeah. yeah. Would he have won the league with Arsenal last season? Uh, not the way that Man City team was playing, man. <laughs> not the yeah. way that Man City team was playing. There's there's other factors you got to look at. But I'm, yeah, I'm interested to see. What do you guys think? Let us know on our Facebook, Instagram, our YouTube channel. Uh, and yeah, make sure to give our podcast five stars on all podcast fi- platforms. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Thanks. But bam Yes, thank you, guys. Ba-bam. But yeah, I picked Villa to win this match. You picked the draw. Uh, up to Villa. This good pick, good pick. All good right. pick. Next up, we're going to move on to uh, currently deducted 10-point Everton, now with four, against Manchester United, the hottest team in the Premier League. I didn't think I would say that this season. Uh, this one ended 3-0 for Manchester United in a match where 30,000 Everton fans held up signs of corruption for the Premier League. What are your thoughts about that? 
So yeah, I think there's there's something there. The Premier League has not come out and stated why 10 points were deducted from Everton. Obviously, we know why, as they broke financial sustainability rules, as they showed a loss of however many million over three years. Can't remember the exact numbers, but that's basically what it three, is. I think it was 305, but because of COVID, they were allowed, I think it was 275 or something like that. And so, so they were deducted these 10 points. Yeah. As these rules yeah. are in place to keep a club financially sustainable, that's what they're there for. But 10 points is a big deduction, man. Yeah. I mean, as we saw, I mean, the two clubs to benefit have been Portmouth and Luton. But Everton sit 19th place on four points. They would be, they would have 14 points, which would put them up in 15th. Yeah. And Luton would be sitting in the and relegation. so it's harsh. And then obviously you have Man City and Chelsea that have, are being investigated, obviously for different aspects though. It's more like Man City cooked their books to make it show like they didn't have losses type of situation which is obviously a lot harder to prove than what Everton showed, just they showed losses. So there's obviously a lot more investigation into the city breaches. So that's going to take more time, and we'll see what comes of the Chelsea breaches, of them kind of paying extra money to agents. And they also, like, reported themselves, right? So They They did, yes. And this was under Roman Abramovich. Yeah, the paid previous owner of Chelsea. Yeah. And so it was definitely Clark. a harsh punishment, man. Like 10 points is a lot. I mean, this is the, the most, most we've ever seen. Most ever in the Premier League, yeah. And it's like the only, obviously only they're fighting get... it. No, yeah, which I think is why you haven't seen the Premier League come out because they know Everton will appeal it. So they don't until the verdict is final, they don't want to come out and release a statement. Well, they should release a statement now because they've been deducted the 10 points and they're sitting in the relegation zone. And these decisions they make could implement champions, could implement, could impact relegation, could impact Champions League qualification. I mean, these are huge, yeah, huge things, yeah. man. That... Not to mention the three teams that went down last season all have 100 million pound lawsuits against them. So they lose those lawsuits. So 300 million which they don't have, it would send them an administration. So they could get docked another further, I think, five points for that. So I think it's, so I guess, long story short, yes, I think it's harsh, and I would like to see the explanation for why 10 points. Okay. Fair. That's what I'd like. I'd like to know more. Okay. Well, with that explosive news, let's get into the match where the pretty much the very first thing that happened was a very explosive moment. Explosive goal, man. Puskas. Goal. goal yes. Right there. Oh, man. Yes. Third minute. Garnacho oh, would score potentially the goal of the year. Definitely. Diego what Dalo a kick. with a wonderful cross. You just see Garnacho take two steps, turn around. I would argue it was not a wonderful oh, cross because it was behind everyone. Okay, fair. It was a wonderfully flighted ball. Didn't say to who, but go with that. Anyways, he <laughs> did wonderfully to... It's, Garnacho did wonderfully just every wonderfully man the full the technique. The sheer, goal. Height of, the sheer height of his foot for that, The too. athleticism, yeah. all of it. All of it, man. What a goal. Most just, impressive yeah. bicycle kick in Premier League history? Probably. Then you got Pro- Cristiano Ronaldo, Wayne Rooney's against Man City. The only bicycle kick I'm trying to think of is I think Ronaldo had one for Real Madrid against Juve. And then the Zlatan one for Sweden against England. Yeah. That one to me is probably the best of all time. But Just from how yeah, far I mean, out he was, yeah. Yeah. But and this I, one, man, I, oh, oh, man, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. You know, Pickford's shot stopping ability, he got nowhere near this one. He was at full stretch. So he wasn't yeah. getting anywhere near it, man. Yeah. Other than that, both teams were poor. Especially so I would say after, after that goal, Everton really did grow into this game. They created chances. I mean, DeCure missed the sitter, Calvert Lewin missed the sitter, <laughs> McNeil missed that's the, that's the Kure I mean, one. Man. I don't. Again, right back to what we said before. Sometimes maybe good, sometimes maybe shit. He was shit in this game. That is for sure. 
they created chances. They didn't score. Man United were not the best. Um, I will say their young 18-year-old holy midfielder, was it Maynu? I believe is his name. Yes. Fantastic. Hot, hot damn, he looked cool, calm, composed. Just like he yeah. had been playing that position for for forever, man. Kobe Maynu, that's what his name is. Yeah. Which had a goal line me, clearance. Leads me, to, leads me to think. If you've had him on the bench all season, why? Eric Ten Hag, have you not played him? So he was playing point? preseason, but he got injured. So I don't know how if that's still been the case or what. But yeah, guy looks good, man. Eighteen years old. Another Found your one. Casemiro replacement right there. There you go. There you go. And it might be time for him now, rather than later, to replace Casemiro. Yeah, Everton would have their chances, but ultimately United would get their second. After VAR would judge Ashley Young to have tripped Anthony Martial in the box, Rashford would step up and put it away. Originally, this was not called a penalty. VAR would reverse the call and call it one. Which call was correct, Targo? The original call or the final decision? It was a foul. He catches him on the thigh. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a little soft, but yes, it was. It was I, I agree it was a foul. I think this was the one I, I had mentioned where it took four minutes from when the actual foul happened. Forever. To when Rashford actually stepped up to take it. And then I guess good showing of captain, captaincy from Bruno to give it to him. Mm-hmm. Maybe. He definitely needed Maybe the not. confidence. So here's what I'll say. Yes, Rashford needed the confidence. Bruno gives it to him. But if Rashford misses that, oh, Oh, I mean, it's the same, same situation as Kai Havertz, and I don't I know. I disagree, because Arsenal had that game in the bag. We're up, what, 2 3 nil. This was 1 nil. This was yes. only 1 nil. Yes. I'm, I'm saying more in, not terms over. Of, more in terms of giving a player confidence. Not it in is terms not the same, the because was. this was only 1 nil, man. I mean, if he misses that and Everton were to score, which they looked like scoring, but couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> United dangerous, get their third. Dangerous situation, man. Dangerous situation is all I'm saying. Very much. Especially all of the emotions surrounding the match. I agree. But United would get their third after some lovely interplay was finished by Anthony Martial with a lovely chip over Jordan. Oh, Pickford. just lifted it just right over the outcoming yeah, pick for wonderful ball by Bruno. And I'll be honest with you in this match. I think Anthony Martial might have been the best player besides Kobe for uh, United, which is shocking. <laughs> Anthony Martial, man, I don't know what to make of him. <laughs> he just he looks had a good like game he doesn't care. He just looks yeah. like he doesn't care. Like his facial expressions, the way he runs, I don't know. But I good mean, for him getting the goal. I mean, honestly, all three Man United attackers got a goal. They needed that. This was great for them. Yeah. Um, my opinion, the passing in this match was so poor. I thought for a minute I was watching a League One match. <laughs> just all over the place. I don't, some balls I was like, well, who are you passing it to? It, like 10 yards away from the intended player. I didn't get it. But more individual brilliance for Ten Hog's side. And they're the most informed team in the Premier League, Targo. They are. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've been harping that. on them. Obviously, they've they've had some issues, but they're getting the results. I mean, that, that that's you can't deny that they're getting the results. Their play might not be the best, but they're sitting pretty, man. They're I mean, not super pretty, but they're in sixth place. They're only six points behind leaders Arsenal. Yeah, and at this point in the season, would I have ever even considered that to be a possibility? No. I did at the beginning of the season because I thought they would do well, but <laughs> that was before I saw them play. Yeah. So, Eric Ten Hag steering the ship, correct? It's For the most like part. It. Yeah. So, you picked United to win this one. I picked Everton. Good job. Woohoo! Woo. Next up to the Monday Nighter, Fulham. Against Wolves, this one would end 
two to the Cottagers. Wolves denied again to yet another late questionable VAR call. It was a foul. I said questionable. I didn't say it was wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but questionable to Wolves fans, then, huh? Yes. Yes. Alex Wobi, though. Former Gunner. You're a Wolves fan. Look at you got a W on your hat and a W on your shirt. You're a Wolves fan tonight. I didn't know if you could read, but that says Washington, <laughs> as in the Apple Cup champions. Anyways, no one listening to this actually cares about that, so I will stop. Alex Wobi would put the Cottagers ahead inside of the first 10 minutes. I believe it was the seventh minute after some great play by Fulham. Honestly, Fulham came out flying in this game. Yeah. Raul Jimenez should have scored, like, in the first minute. I think it was literally, yeah, I was going to say, like, 60 to 90 seconds before this happened. <laughs> so it was, yeah. Wolves came out, or not Wolves, Fulham came out flying. Fulham came out Scored flying. in the seventh minute, yeah. Yeah. And Hwang then Hichan Wolves would, grew into the game. Yeah. <laughs> Wang Hee-chan would hit the crossbar in the 14th minute off a wonderful counter. I never really thought the ball was going in, but did well to hit the crossbar. Uh, and then Matthias closer than I thought. I thought he took yeah. the shot too early. I did too. And then Matthias Cunha would level the match seven minutes later off of yep. a wonderful ball and header at the back post. William would put the home side ahead in the 59th minute through the penalty spot. Tom Kearney's foot was stepped on by Nelson Semedo. His challenge was just about time, but. Just yeah. about stepped on. Just about. Penalty for you? Just about. Soft. Yeah. With a couple of, well, two soft penalties. And then uh, we would have another penalty. This time, the other direction, as that Korean guy, Hwang Hee Chan, would put it away in the 75th minute as uh, Tim Ream would clatter into him, pretty much running him over. That one was definitely a foul, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> no questionable there. <laughs> Tim Ream and said, then, no, thank you. And then we would have another one. Another one. Uh, Wolves would be involved in a questionable VR call for the fourth time this season. Giving away a penalty uh, as Anthony Robinson would cut the ball back and Joe Gomez would intercept it. First touch was heavy Wilson would bundle get bundled over by the Brazilian I thought it was harsh you could see him try to pull up by the end of the day it was a foul it was yeah William would step up and put it away uh but yeah this is the one Targo it took four minutes for them that's what it was yeah I mean there's forever and then uh yeah that was it Wolves. I also thought Carlos Venusius, man, was lucky to be on the field. So he and Kilman, Wolves defender, you know, there's down on the ground as Venusius stood up. He hits Kilman in the like nose mouth area with his forehead. This was in the 87th minute. I thought he was a little lucky to be on the field, if I'm being honest. He only got a yellow. Yeah. And I mean, he he stayed standing up and just pretty much put his arms up. Asking the ref what the hell. I think if Kilman pulls a, a Bruno Fernandes and, you know, holds his face, going down, crying, up I bet. In the air, lands on the ground. Yeah. I, I think I think you're right. I think he would have been sent off at that point. But, yeah, I mean, first Premier League match where they had four penalties and all four were scored. Three to two for Fulham. This was a pretty good game, too. Yeah, I thought for uh, Matthias Cunha's goal, man. Oh, what's that defender's name or midfielder's name? Belagrade, Belagard. Yeah, Belagard. He, he took Robinson through the spin cycle, man. Put him through yeah. the spin cycle yeah. before he crossed that yeah. ball in for Cunha to head in back post. <laughs> so that was. I always watch the Americans see how they do, but Wolves, As man, they sit in twelfth, and that win for Fulham takes them up to fourteenth. So that yeah, Fulham man. needed that win. They did. You know, three teams, four teams tied on 15 points now. Two teams with 16. So any one of those teams could jump up into 10th place with the victory next week. Yes. All right. So let's move on. I made a prediction 
on the last episode about Juventus and Inter Milan as they went head to head in Serie A this weekend. I said Juve would get points off of Inter. And they did as they drew 1 1 in this game. <laughs> I was right. They got a 1 1 draw at the Allianz Stadium in Turin. Dusan Vlahovic scores the first for Juve. After he originally wins the ball from Denzel Dumfries, and he plays it out to Federico Chiesa, who then crosses it back for Vlahovic, and he has a first time lovely taken finish. He made it look oh, easy, but that is not an easy yeah. finish. No, it's not, especially ball coming across your body to put it inside of the far post. Yes. And especially the driven ball by Chiesa. Yeah, wonderful finish. Looks like he's finding his form finally for Juventus. And what a difference, Federico. A healthy. Federico Chiesa makes for Juventus, man. Yeah. But Inter, they do equalize through, honestly, lovely build-up play from the goalkeeper to attack in a matter of seconds. And that man, man, Lautaro Martinez scores 13 goals in 13 games in City Dude, he's on fire. Guy's on fire. He's on fire. If only he could do that for them in the Champions League. <laughs> Well, they're not doing terrible in the Champions League. I mean, no, they're sitting no. second in their group. They're they're going to qualify. But, yeah. I mean, honestly, Marcus Taram looks like one heck of a signing. I think he, the way he plays, allows Martinez to score all these goals. Because Taram's definitely a runner off the ball, running into space. And yeah. it allows Martinez to kind of sit there and goal and have these finishes. Yeah, it allows him to play a little more free as far as his positioning goes. Um, and Taram, as you just said, one of his best qualities is to pull the defenders out and then run onto it, giving him much more space. So no more doubling Lataro Martinez for most teams, and he's reaping the rewards. And I will say, I'm going to say it right now, Federico DeMarco, top three best wing backs in the world. Yeah, I mean, we saw it last season. It's lightning quick. Can dribble past pretty much anybody. And he plays in wonderful balls into the box. Guy can pass, man. He is such a great passer. He's quick. Yeah, I love watching him play as a wingback. And even Denzel Dumfries, I feel like, has stepped up his game as a wingback. Yes, he has. But Serie A, man, heating up a little bit. Inter Milan still sitting in first on 32 points. Juve in second on 30 points. And then AC Milan back in third on 26 points. Yeah, Juve coming back for redemption this season after uh, pretty much being in the lead for the league all season and then getting docked points. Well, they weren't in the lead, but they were towards the least Champions League. (laughs) But yeah, man, good pick. Um, I didn't know who to choose, so I went with uh, you on that one, and we both picked a drop. And I'll be honest that I followed your suit because I didn't have anyone that I favored. So, all right, you've been defending well. So good picks. Let's get into the rest of our uh, pint-sized predictions from uh, last week. You uh, you did get the Juventus and Inter Milan one. I had a bunch, so let's get into mine. All right. Okay, let's get into some yours. Were, some were maybe good, and some were maybe shit. So you're in Klopp complained before and after the game about the amount of games and the travel for players. And we all knew that one was a gimme. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Everton beating United. Nope. (laughs) Liverpool beating city. Nope. VR make a questionable call on that one. Possibly. Uh, Possibly. Maybe I guess the Allison. Yeah, you could argue, but the, the not, not the way I thought the other way around. I did get Villa beating Spurs. Spurs fans still think Good they're going to win the league, so that's one thing you can always guarantee is Spurs think they're going to win a trophy and then don't. <laughs> uh, Chelsea lost to Newcastle, so... Um, but yeah, that Broadcast, went wrong too, yeah. Broadcast did show quite a few Jordies without shirts on. So of course. I did get that one right, but let's be honest, everybody knew that was going to happen too. So, with that said, Targo... Let's get into the newest round of our pint size predictions. All right, man. So my first pint size prediction, Champions League edition. I'm going to say Manchester United beat Galatasaray. 
In Istanbul. In Istanbul. They're in hot form. It's good. Garnacho scored. Martiel scored. Rashford scored. I think they got something. Luke Shaw was back at the weekend against Everton, so that's a huge boost for them. I'm going to say they beat Galatasaray. My other pint-sized prediction is I think Napoli are going to get a draw against Real Madrid. Real Madrid have all but quali- they've qualified already. I think we'll see a makeshift squad as they rest some players. It's coming back from international break, back to club football, going into the Champions League. I think we might see some players you normally don't see, and I think Napoli capitalized to get a draw. And so those are my pint-sized predictions. What are your pint-sized predictions? Well, I, I'm going to comment on that, uh, just the Madrid fielding a makeshift squad. Um, they have enough injuries right now. I think their first team squad is a makeshift squad. So, <laughs> Okay, okay. But yes, my pint-sized predictions for the week. I'm going to go opposite. Galatasaray beats Manchester United as they come crashing back down to earth in the Champions League. Watch well, us be both wrong and they get a draw. Probably. Let's be honest. That'll be the most likely scenario. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, FC Porto to beat Barcelona, who have not Again. been in lately. Do the double over them in the group oh, stage. Oh, that was Shakhtar. No, that was Shakhtar that beat them. I lied. It yeah, wasn't sorry. Porto. Porto to beat Barcelona. Heard it here first, folks. <laughs> and then my big Champions League prediction, Sevilla will lose to PSV and then miss out on the Europa League. Oh, but that's where their home is. I know. And then finally, for my last pint size prediction, Eric Ten Hag will win manager of the month for November. He's got three wins, zero goals conceded. Okay. Those are my pint size predictions. What do you guys uh, well, those are... have up your sleeves? You got any pint size predictions? Let us know. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Make your own videos. Hashtag us at Pint Size Predictions or tag us at Bruce and Banter FC. Yes, and don't forget to check out our Redbubble account. Get all your Bruise and Banter merch. Help us keep doing this. It really helps us out. But that brings us to the end of this episode, man. What a what a week of football. Chelsea what, get what slaughtered by Newcastle. Liverpool, Chelsea, or Liverpool, Man City play out to a draw, allowing Arsenal to go top of the table. Spurs falter to Villa, and Burnley use Burnley lose yet again. Surprise! We'll see what Surprise. the Champions Surprise. League has up for us, and what Match Week 14 has up. But on that note, thank you guys for listening. We love you guys so much. As always, cheers.